Lots of people around the world are shocked by the discovery of an old Bible. Turkish authorities have confirmed that an ancient Bible thought to be 1,500 years old. This includes both Christians and atheists. People used to be forbidden to read this old book, but it holds some very important secrets that make us think about where we came from and why we're here. These secrets go to the heart of what it means to be human. What might this forbidden book tell us about where we came from, why we're here, and the mysteries of the universe? How does this discovery change the way we think about people? Let us find out. Stories from the Bible have been very important to Christians their whole lives. They have learned them by reading and hearing them. There are Old and New Testaments in this amazing book. Together, they tell the story of events that show Jesus lived on earth. Some events and writers are a little different, but they all point to the same thing. Jesus was honest. So, a big event took place that shocked Christians around the world. A Bible that was about 2,000 years old was found. It made people question some of the things they thought they knew, especially the idea that Jesus was not killed. It wasn't just any Bible. The book was said to have been written by St. Barnabas, who was Paul's close friend. The crooks who were trying to take it along with other valuable items were caught. According to the 2,000-year-old Bible, Gabriel tells Mary about her son's crucifixion and how he will be protected from it. The high priest, Herod Antipas, and Pontius Pilate talk about what to do about him. Jesus and his disciples hide in Nicodemus' house and have the Last Supper there. Judas Iscariot betrays him for 30 pieces of silver. God then tells Gabriel, Michael, Raphael, and Uriel to save Jesus by taking him out by the window that looks toward the south. When Judas gets to the house, he changes his voice and appearance to look like Jesus. The other followers are already asleep. He is shocked to learn that people think he is Jesus and have caught him. Pilate tells them to put him on the cross, and he is buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus asks to be able to see his mother and friends so that he can tell them what has happened. The pages of this amazing find are made from animal skin and have handmade letters that are hard to copy. This book, which was written in Syriac, an Aramaic form that some say was Jesus' first language, is thought to be worth $20 million. Experts looked at the ancient object in great detail and determined that it was made between 15,000 and 2,000 years ago, or even earlier. This discovery is important not only because it is old and valuable, but also because it changes the way we think about history and religious stories. Researchers and Christians alike are still interested in the puzzles that are hidden in this old text. They add another layer of mystery to Christianity. It says that after Jesus died, the disciples spread out across Palestine and the rest of the world. As always, lies were spreading lies about the truth, which Satan hates. Because some bad people pretending to be disciples said that Jesus was dead and not risen from the dead. Others said that Jesus had actually died and risen from the dead. And still others said, and still do say, that Jesus is the Son of God. Paul fell for one of these lies. Then based on how much we understand, we tell those who fear God that they might be saved on the last day of God's punishment. The Gospel ends with, Amen. This Gospel of Barnabas is an interesting book that changes the well-known story from the Bible. Most people think that Jesus was crucified, but this text says something very different. Instead, it imagines a different situation in which Judas, not Jesus, faced the crucifixion, and Jesus, against all expectations, went to heaven while he was still living. The fact that Barnabas' gospel goes against traditional Christian beliefs makes it even more interesting. In this case, Jesus is not seen as God's son, but as a prophet who was sent by God to share God's word. Ibrahim Al-Taibil was an author and Arabic-Spanish translator. In a letter from Tunisia in 1634 that is in the Biblioteca Nacional de España, he may have made the first reference to the gospel. He talked about the gospel of St. Barnabas, where the light is. Christians don't believe the gospel of Barnabas because they think it's not as good as the four canonical gospels and is a fake. Togardo Siburian of the Bandung Theological Seminary says that it is often used by Muslim propagandists in a guerrilla fashion to prey on Christians with weak theological commitments. This is said to be the book's usefulness as new information for the secret Islamization of Christian churches today. The book also makes a big claim. Apostle Paul, a famous figure in Christian history, is not who he says he is. This story is even more interesting because St. Barnabas, who is thought to have written the book, was close to Apostle Paul. Because of this surprise, experts in the Bible and history are wondering if the Gospel of Barnabas is real. Muslim scholars criticize and reject parts or all of the Gospel of Barnabas. American academic Amina in Lois says that the many differences between the Gospel and the Quran make them less important. In the January 1977 issue of the Islamic World League newspaper, Syrian writer Yahya al-Hashimi called it a rant by a Jew meant to stir up hatred between Christians and Muslims. 
Al-Hashimi said that there was no need to use apocryphal gospels to show Muhammad's support for Islam. In chapter 39, Jesus calls Muhammad by name for the first time of nine times. The gospel tells of Jesus' transfiguration and his announcement that Muhammad will be the savior who will come after him. Researchers are trying to figure out if the council that wrote the New Testament purposefully left out facts from the Gospel of Barnabas and other similar texts that might have been controversial. The most common theory is that they did this to favor more canonical passages while leaving out potentially controversial information from these texts. However, some scholars have come up with a different explanation, which adds a unique twist to the story. According to them, the Gospel of Barnabas isn't in the Bible because the Bible doesn't talk about how he died. He's the only saint whose death isn't talked about in official Bible stories. This strange old book has gotten so much attention from experts that even the Vatican, which is very important to Christians, has decided to look into it. The Gospel of Barnabas is an interesting book that makes people think about what they believe and encourages them to do so. Also, experts who looked at the book closely agree that it's real, which clears up a lot of people's doubts. On a different note, the Catholic Church's long history has always been interesting to people. Some parts of this history are well known, but others aren't, like old writings and the Vatican's huge archive, which is full of thousands of books that could tell a story. According to the Nicene Creed, the Trinity means that God is one but also three people, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Son. Islam disagrees with Trinitarianism because it believes in Tawheed, which means indivisible oneness, and sees the Trinity as an insult because it makes God and his creation equal. Muslims think that Jesus, like other Islamic prophets, was human and never claimed to be God. In the Gospel of Barnabas, Jesus is said to deny being the Son of God. Verse 7. A lot of Muslim apologists use the Gospel of Barnabas because it supports a central Islamic idea that is different from what the New Testament says. It says that Jesus did not die on the cross. Instead, Judas Iscariot died in his place after being switched for Jesus at the last minute. Many Muslims agree with this view, since most of them think that someone else died on the cross instead of Jesus. Pakistani scholar Ramatullah Khairanawi was the first Muslim to write about the gospel in his Ijaz-e-Isawi, 1853. Rashid Rida's Arabic version, which came out in 1908, 214, made it more well known. According to Pakistani scholar Abul Allah Maududi, the Gospel of Barnabas is more genuine than the four canonical Gospels. Rita thought it was superior to the canonical Gospels because it had divine knowledge, glorification of the Creator, and understanding of ethics, manners, and morals. The Bible is a religious book that millions of people around the world love. It is thought to have been written around 1000 BC by people like Moses. It contains stories like the famous parable of the Good Samaritan and the miracle of feeding a lot of people with just five loaves and two fish. The original version of the Bible had more books than today's editions, which has caused some people to wonder. The fact that these writings are missing makes people wonder if religious groups might be hiding information. As people learned more, they dug deeper into these old myths and books, especially those that were about mysterious beings that have captured many people's imagination. The search for answers to these puzzling stories adds to the complicated tapestry of religious history. In the world of scary demons, Valak is well known. It's been in several movies and in old stories from the 17th century, but it's not a nun like it is in the movies. In the stories, Valak is a powerful being that can control many snakes to do its will. This old book, which historians say is a mix of spells, magic tricks, natural secrets, and ancient knowledge, talks a lot about Valak and its stories. There are a lot of similar beings in other stories, which makes this one even more interesting. Many of these beings have disappeared from history or been purposely hidden. A lot of people think that hidden volumes in the Vatican contain unknown mysteries that will probably never be revealed. The mysteries surrounding these esoteric beings and their likely connection to ancient documents makes for an interesting story that makes you want to learn more about the unknown. In the Gospel of Barnabas, Jesus is not crucified. Instead, Judas Iscariot, whose face was made to look like Jesus, was put on the cross in his place, and God raised Jesus to heaven. This fits with the common readings of Anissa, which say that Jesus wasn't crucified, but rather his double was. They were proud to say, we killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they didn't really kill or crucify him. It was all fake. Even people who support the crucifixion have doubts because they don't have enough information and just guess they didn't kill him. Instead, Allah raised him up, and Allah is powerful and wise. Quran 4, 157-158 Docetism is a heretical belief that Jesus' human appearance was an illusion. The Gospel's account of Jesus' crucifixion is thought to have been influenced by or adopted this idea. 
According to David Sox, the Gospel of Barnabas shows Judas Iscariot in a more sympathetic light than the canonical Gospels, which show him as a wicked betrayer. In Christian tradition, his name is linked to lying while pretending to be friends. In Italy and Ireland, religious leaders like Vatican and Anglican priests agree that demonic possession is a growing problem in today's society. However, both religious leaders and scientists stress the dangers of spiritual abuse. Father Dino, an exorcist from Sicily, says that the church still doesn't agree on exorcism doctrines, but he stresses how important it is to get training in exorcism and says that even exorcists make mistakes. On the other end of the spectrum, Father Collins in Ireland sees an increasing need among the Irish people for help and direction in dealing with what they think are demonic powers. This need has grown over the past few years. According to the Bible, Jesus drove out demons from people who were possessed by evil. Catholic priests divide possession into many categories. Obsession is marked by sudden irrationality, obsessive thinking, and a desire to hurt oneself. People pass out and do things that aren't in line with what they think is right, which causes problems. Possession is when Satan or another demon completely takes over someone's body and uses it against their will. In Catholic teachings, the person is sometimes seen as partly to blame, as if they did something to let Satan's power into their life. When people talk about this kind of spiritual event in religious groups, it makes things more complicated and makes people think about where faith, scary supernatural events, and who is responsible for what all come together. Infestations happen when devils take over things, animals, or homes. But subjection is when someone gives up their freedom of choice and lets their body be used for bad things on purpose. Possession can show up in many ways, such as superhuman strength, language skills, knowledge of esoteric facts, heresy, anger, and using bad language a lot. Catholic teaching stresses that demonic possession can be mistaken for mental health disorders and warns against mixing the two. Exorcisms are only legal when overseen by a bishop and must follow strict rules. However, these laws are often broken, and many people seek the help of unlicensed exorcists instead of going through the formalities needed to get Vatican permission. This secret search for spiritual comfort is what makes the field of exorcism and demonic intervention so interesting. A lot of people are interested in the Gospel of Thomas, an early Christian work that isn't part of the New Testament. It's interesting because it shows a different side of Christianity than what most people think of when they hear the word Christianity. This is especially true for people who like to think for themselves about spiritual things, no matter what religion they follow. Instead of stories about what Jesus did, the Gospel of Thomas has 114 things that Jesus has said. Some of these sayings are the same as those in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are also New Testament Gospels. What's interesting is that Paul himself talks about the number 17 in 1 Corinthians 2.9. The sayings in the Gospel of Thomas, on the other hand, are almost all unique to this book. Understanding the meaning of the Apostle's name Thomas in the Bible is important for understanding the Gospel of Thomas as a whole. It is important to note that, like the New Testament Gospels attributed to Matthew and John, Thomas is not the real author. Thomas means twin in Aramaic and Syriac. This passage describes Thomas as Jesus' spiritual twin, implying a strong spiritual bond. Thomas achieves spiritual equality by achieving gnosis, which means redemption through a deep, mystical understanding of reality's true spiritual nature, especially the ultimate essence of the self. However, almost all of the sayings in the Gospel of Thomas are unique to this book. Understanding the meaning of the Apostle's name Thomas in the Bible is important for understanding the Gospel of Thomas as a whole. It is important to note that, like the New Testament Gospels attributed to Matthew and John, Thomas is not the real author. In the Gospel of Thomas, gnosis means spiritual insight and understanding. It says that anyone can reach this level. The main goal is to help people become spiritually like Christ, as shown by the phrase, whoever drinks from my mouth will become as I am. I will also turn into him, and the secret things will be shown to him. God's knowledge goes beyond what we can understand and can't be put into words, as shown in the Gospel of Thomas. When Jesus talks to his followers and they want clear steps on how to be saved, he doesn't like it when they're thinking too simply. Instead, he gives them and us tricky sayings that make us believe more intuitively and less logically. In early Christianity, the entrance of God's kingdom and Jesus' second coming were highly anticipated events. However, the Gospel of Thomas contradicts traditional interpretations of these concepts, saying three states, the kingdom of God is within you and all around you. It underlines that people who achieve self-awareness will experience this spiritual condition of being. Unlike the familiar anticipation of future earthly events, according to the Gospel, the kingdom of God is a present and accessible reality 
for those who attain gnosis in the here and now. Most academics assume that the Gospel of Thomas took its current shape in the late 1st or early 2nd century ADCE. It has a distinct theological standpoint. There are sayings about Jesus that were popular among the first Christians that are used in the Gospel of Thomas. It doesn't seem to have been based on the later New Testament Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Even when the sayings are similar, they are spoken in very different ways in the Gospel of Thomas and the New Testament. This suggests that the author of Thomas got ideas from both spoken and written sources. It was tried to be hidden, but the Gospel of Thomas became popular in late antiquity and was used as an example by early Christian writers. Its influence lasted until the 5th and 6th centuries. There are only two versions of the Gospel, a broken Greek version that is probably written in the original language, and a Coptic translation that is almost complete and comes from the Nag Hammadi Library. Egypt is known for its unique way of writing with pictures called hieroglyphics. The Egyptians also made some of the earliest written works, like the Book of the Dead and the Pyramid Scrolls, which are about spells and getting ready for death and what happens after death. Later, they made scrolls with secret words for staying healthy, getting rich, or even casting spells against enemies. These writings became important to Egyptian culture over time. One amazing book is called The Egyptian Handbook of Ritual Power. It was written in Coptic, which is a mix of Greek and Egyptian writing from the 2nd century BC. It's said to hold secrets from a Christian group that were lost in history. The Handbook of Ritual Power has 20 pages of parchment with spells and curses that you can't find in any older Egyptian texts. An English translation of the Italian text was published by Oxford University Press in 1907. The next year, an Arabic translation by Egyptian scholar Rashid Rida became popular in the Muslim world. It was translated by Christian Sa'adeh. Rida's journal, Al Manar, had promotional excerpts and information on the Arabic translation before it came out in July 1907. Now let's talk about the interesting Bible figure Enoch. Not only was he Adam's great-great-great-great-grandson, but he also stood as the great-grandfather of none other than Noah himself. Enoch led a life of profound holiness and unwavering faith, dedicated entirely to the divine. Beyond his illustrious ancestry, Enoch also took on the role of Methuselah's father, a name echoing biblical history for holding the record of the most extended lifespan mentioned in the sacred texts. The legacy of Enoch lives on through the generations as the patriarch of many, leaving an indelible mark on the unfolding biblical story. What makes Enoch's story truly extraordinary is that, along with Elijah, he is one of the few people in the Bible who seemingly skipped death and went straight to heaven. Enoch's story, which is filled with longevity, lineage, and a celestial departure, adds a new dimension to the story. In Genesis 5.24, there's a strange part where God takes him away after Enoch has lived for 356, which makes Enoch's story even more interesting. Enoch's life was full of strong faith, which made God love him so much that he didn't let him die, which is a rare favor that not many people get. People in both Jewish and Christian traditions remember and talk about Enoch's story a lot, even outside of the Bible. He is known as the Scribe of Judgment and is credited with writing the Book of Enoch. His name is mentioned in many biblical texts, such as the Gospel of Luke, the Epistle to the Hebrews, and the Epistle of Jude. The Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodoxy, and Oriental Orthodoxy all honor Enoch as a saint, which raises his status. Enoch's role is more than just a prophet. To learn about Enoch's past and his encounters with beings from other worlds, you need to read the apocryphal texts that are said to be his. These chapters shed light on the mysterious sides of this interesting biblical hero and open a door to a place where the holy and the earthly live together in joyful harmony. Parts 636 of the Book of Enoch are very important because they talk about what happens after we die, the end of the world, and the final judgment. These important parts are called Watcher's Book, and they talk about angels, the tree of life, Jerusalem, and the whole universe. Part 6-4 of the Book of Enoch is about angels who made a big mistake and mixed with humans, which created the Nephilim. The Nephilim are also known as the Fall. There are several interpretations of the relationship between God's sons and the Nephilim. Some believe God's sons are fallen angels, and the Nephilim are their progeny from human women. This viewpoint is stated in the First Book of Enoch, a non-canonical Jewish text that is widely accepted. The First Book of Enoch describes the Nephilim as giants, implying that they are associated with people of extraordinary stature. The seeming immensity of the Nephilim is sometimes linked to their supernatural origin, which raises theological concerns regarding angels or demons physically mating with humans. Another less supernatural explanation says that the Nephilim were actually bad people. This view says that they were related to Seth, Adam's good son, but they chose not to follow God. 
The Scythian view, which was backed by famous people like St. Augustine, many church fathers, and many Jewish scholars, says that humankind's daughters were the sinful wives of Cain, Adam's bad son. These old prophecies about Jesus are very similar to what the Bible says, especially in the book of Revelation. The astronomy book is an interesting part of the book of Enoch that talks about the stars and how important they are. Then there's the fantasy visions part, which is a major prophecy that covers all of human history, from the beginning to the end times and the judgment. It's scary how true it is about things that have happened, are happening, and will happen. The chapter called The Weeks Prophecy is like the book of Daniel because it gives us a scenario to think about. Finally, Enoch gives us advice and wisdom by stressing how important it is to answer to God. There's a surprise about Noah that tells us a story we haven't heard before. It talks about how his father Lamech and grandfather Methuselah were very sorry that they didn't save everyone. Although each song is different, they all have one main idea. The bad guys are going to be punished, and the good guys are going to be given gifts. The Book of Enoch has interesting references that don't seem to match up with what the Bible says. For example, the Bible says that Enoch went to heaven before Noah was born. But in Enoch chapter 10 verses 1 to 3, Noah is mentioned by name. In the Bible, there is a supernatural meeting where the Most Holy One tells Lamech's son to give Noah an important message in front of Uriel. This message warns of a terrible flood that will destroy everything in its path. The Bible doesn't explain Enoch's return to earth after his trip to heaven, which brings up the question of how he knew about Noah and the impending flood if he wrote the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch has an interesting part that says the earth's destruction was caused by a demon named Azazel. Chapter 10 verses 8 and 9 talk about how Azazel taught people bad things, which caused a lot of evil and made the world dirty. The Bible, on the other hand, mostly talks about Lucifer, who is also called Satan or the Devil, and doesn't name any other demons. There may be other demons, but the Bible keeps things simple by saying Satan. Then in chapter 13, verse 5 and 6 of the Book of Enoch, there's a shocking statement. It says that the fallen angels felt bad about what they did. This is very different from what the Bible says, which makes it clear that Satan and his angels will spend eternity in hell and will never be able to say sorry again. But God says that they can be sorry and turn away from their sins. The Lord is patient and doesn't want anyone to die, so he begs for repentance. The Book of Enoch gives us the interesting idea that after their first rebellion, demons not only repented, but also lost the ability to talk to God. They think they can't look up to heaven or connect with the divine. However, in Position, Chapter 1, Satan talks directly with God in heaven about a position and allegiance. Enoch's image is used to show this. Imagine a city where the streets are not only made of gold, but also of dazzling, translucent glass that reflects its purity. Delving further into the ethereal descriptions, Chapter 14, verse 10 of the Book of Enoch reveals a celestial building of pure crystal brilliance. It's a vision that goes beyond human conception, adding levels of mystery to the divine realm. When we look at the Book of Enoch pages compared to the biblical story, we find an interesting web of contradictions. This is not a single case, but a complex tapestry woven over many sections, most notably chapter 14, lines 9 to 25, where strange things happening in the sky make us curious. The journey into the heavenly spheres takes an unexpected turn, challenging both the sacred texts and the limits of what we know today in science. In chapter 33 verses 1 to 4, Enoch says that he has meticulously numbered and mapped every star in the sky, much like a professional star map maker. However, Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 22 says that it is impossible to number all the stars. There are so many of them, astronomers now think there are about 100 million stars in the Milky Way alone, that it seemed impossible to keep track of them all, let alone all the stars in other galaxies far away. But the Book of Enoch talks about top. After that, chapter 41 makes a funny claim that the wind, snow, hail, and even the moon come from a wooden box high in the sky. This story is out there going against what the Bible usually says. These strange stories make you wonder why the Book of Enoch wasn't included in the Bible. These departures from common beliefs show how different they are from the religious writings we hold dear. Explore the Book of Enoch's multidimensional nature. Even though the book gives a broad overview of the Bible's story, including Genesis, it raises an important question. Why does this huge work not belong in the holy pages of the Bible? The first Book of Enoch is definitely interesting, but it's important to remember that. It is not considered scripture because it has not been inspired by God in the way that canonical texts are. Interestingly, the Book of Enoch appears in the apocryphal book of Baruch, which is found in historical manuscripts from the early church. However, the fact that it consistently contradicts well-known biblical stories raises questions. The book is labeled as pseudepigrapha literature, 
which suggests that there may be a problem. The author may not be who they say they are. The Book of Enoch was likely written long after Enoch's time by someone who claimed to be him. So the Book of Enoch might not benefit those looking for clear teachings from the Gospel. However, Jude, a writer from back then, used the Book of Enoch in his work. During his time, the book was pretty well known and the part he used supported his message about the Gospel really well. It's important to know that the Book of Enoch differs from the Ethiopic version, which is considered a pseudepigrapha, meaning it's falsely attributed to an ancient author. This supports the doubts about who wrote the book, suggesting it was made after Jesus' time. The goal might have been to share Enoch's wisdom and teachings, but it got tricky because Methuselah, an important character, was left out, showing how unreliable passing stories by word of mouth can be. It's like going on a big adventure to try to figure out what's real and what's just a story from a long time ago. What do you think about this old book? Leave a review and subscribe to the channel if you like what you see so far.